Hello, and welcome to another edition of Questions for Lawyers. I'm your host, Jeff Edelman. I'm a personal injury attorney. And I started this show because even as a PI lawyer, I do get a lot of questions from clients and people looking for legal help that are not in my field. So I have to consult with a lot of experts in the legal community in different areas of law. And today we're honored to have with us Brian Koch from Greenberg Troy, who's gonna be talking with us about commercial litigation. And since we practice this a little bit, I think this is gonna be a really good intro for you, Brian. I have a feeling. Absolutely. <laughs> Could you please introduce yourself to everyone? Sure. Hello uh, and good evening. My name is Brian Koch. I'm a shareholder in the Fort Lauderdale office of Greenberg Troig uh, in the litigation department. Um, as a litigator, I represent companies and individuals involved in uh, business disputes primarily, uh, but they could also be individual disputes depending on the nature of the particular case. Um, as a civil litigator or commercial litigator, you know, the, the issues are generally fights over money. Um, either some clients are trying to obtain money from somebody else, for example, a breach of contract, or you have situations. We can hear. Great. <laughs> can hear. Uh, or we also have uh, uh, situations where we're defending claims. So somebody else may be trying to uh, um, uh, obtain money. And, and of course, our clients are uh, defending that particular position, depending on the nature of the case. And how long have you been with Greenberg Troy? I've been with Greenberg for uh, about 13 years. I've been practicing uh, collectively for about 16 years now. Um, and I've you know, been privileged to, uh, to work with a couple of great law firms during my career, primarily at Greenberg, uh, where I came in as a, uh, a junior associate and, and moved up the ranks uh, uh, during the course of my, my time there. What type of legal matters do you generally handle, Brian? Sure. I handle, um, you know, business and corporate disputes, but what does that mean? Um, I do a lot of employment related work. So we're representing companies um, involved in different aspects of employment. Um, so even though I'm a litigator, one of the goals oftentimes is to avoid litigation, is to try to um, be a problem solver, to mm -hmm. help the clients overcome uh, issues, you know, they may, you know, ask for, you know, is this policy that we're doing, is this kosher, is this something we should be doing, is there a way to fix this and make it better? And we can look at that and, and obviously there's regulations that are constantly changing um, depending on different administrations, how mm -hmm. they interpret certain issues. And so we're there to guide our clients through that process. Well, I know that you and I have been talking about doing this show for a while and you were waiting for something to be done. You just got out of a three week trial. Yes. Okay. I would be remiss if I didn't ask you to talk with the viewers and listeners about your uh, discrimination case that you handled for a large employer. Can you tell us a little bit about that? I can. Um, okay. You know, the case itself involved a uh, consumer products company um, and the plaintiff in that particular case was alleging uh, disability discrimination or handicap discrimination under the Florida Civil Rights Act. There were also claims for emotional distress and then there was also a claim for defamation. Um, jury trials are, you know, by definition, they're, they're tried in front of uh, essentially a random group of individuals, you know, fellow citizens. Um, who are doing their patriotic duty by coming in and, and serving as jurors and they're giving up of their time and it's a, it's a different process. There's, you could have a trial in front of a judge, which would be a bench trial. You could have a trial in front of a jury, which is a jury trial. Sometimes you also have, um, you know, some type of proceedings or arbitration. So that might be a private panel or it might be a single arbitrator. It really depends on the nature of the case. With respect to the jury trial, um, you know, jury trials generally take a little bit longer because there's a limited period of time where you can actually present testimony and evidence in front of the jury on a, on a daily basis. Right. Um, and then you're obviously working with more people and more people's schedules. So sometimes the amount of time that you have to present in the course of a day may be less when you're dealing with in front of a jury than you might otherwise have if it was just a bench trial. And so our case ended up going uh, uh, three weeks. It was a 12 day trial. Um, ultimately, after uh, a couple of hours, the jury 
uh, deliberated and um, gave a verdict uh, completely in our client's favor on all counts. Well, so congratulations. We were uh, we were ecstatic, but also very happy for the clients because um, you know this is a process, and you know sometimes uh, uh, litigation tends to extend over a period of time. Um, you know, most of my cases, most of the things that I do are, are the types of cases that can be resolved. Some cases I can resolve them within a week of getting a file. In other cases, it can take months. In other cases, it can take years. Um, it partly depends on who you're dealing with, what the issues are that are at stake, how important those issues are, um, what type of fight, that, you know, is going to be put up by the other side, um, trying to be reasonable, trying to work together. There's you know, every case and everything that you do, um, you know, is individualized, you know, and so you have to look at each of the facts on a case by case basis. Sure. Um, there have definitely been times where we advise clients on uh, on how to avoid litigation or to resolve a case early on because it makes sense to do so. Other times, if, if you feel that you're right and, um, you know, you've got a position and you want to defend that, you know, you have the ability to do that too. We, we have a, a system in place that's designed for justice, it's designed for fairness, and that works on both sides of the aisle. Well, I hear a, a theme coming from you about trying to get people to avoid litigation. I think that's really important because number one, litigation is very expensive, and number two, it's so uncertain. It's not as simple as, oh, I just want to try the case. There's a lot at risk there if some if you take a case to trial, whether it be one of my type of cases or something in in your uh, wheelhouse. Oh, absolutely, and and you know cases come in all different sizes and shapes. You know, so you could have a case over a three hundred thousand dollar contract, and it could be for purchasing of a home, and there might be defects associated with that, mm -hmm. something that's undisclosed. Then you have a situation, for example, the case that I that I just had. You know, the plaintiff in that case was seeking over eight million dollars. You know, and so obviously you can mount a a defense when you know, depending on what the allegations are and what the risk and what the exposure is. Um, just like everything else, it's it's if you have reasonable minds, you can try to work towards a solution, trying to create win-win situations that might not otherwise be apparent on their face. Um, but sometimes, by the time you're getting into litigation. You know, sometimes communication is broken down. Um, you know, it's it's a hard position. You know, people you know are very steadfast in their mm -hmm. positions, and you kind of have to navigate through that. Ultimately, always looking out for what your client's best interests are. Um, sometimes it may be to fight and go all the way. And and you know, for example, you know, if you have cases involving non-compete agreements. Um, Either it's going to be enforced or it's not going to be enforced. There's there's not a lot of wiggle room. There's not a, there's there may not necessarily be middle ground. Um, you know, it really just depends on the the particular case. When you're dealing with civil cases and the fights are over money, then sometimes it becomes a matter of how much is one side willing to pay versus how much is the other side willing to accept. You brought up non compete agreements, uh, Brian, and I know you're involved in those. Are you involved in the drafting of those or just? If it doesn't go go well, it needs to be litigated. Uh, the answer is both. And, okay. you know, we will work and help clients and draft um, non-compete agreements to mm -hmm. protect their legitimate business interests. Um, other times, and I've been on both sides where, you know, there are certain cases where, um, you know, somebody's trying to enforce a non-compete because they've got a legitimate interest and, and a former employer or employee may be infringing upon that, trying to take away clients, take away business. That was the company's, you know, so you have those types of situations, but you also have situations where if there's an overreach or if it's uh, if it's too broad, then you can try to work around and, and try to create a, a solution or a fix. And so there's still potential negotiation points with respect to those issues. But if you if you don't assert yourself and and put yourself in a position to begin with, you may not be in a position to negotiate at all. Right. Um, conversely, if you are faced with uh, a situation where you know you're somebody's asking you to sign one, um, you probably want to consult a lawyer ahead of time to be like, hey, you know, is this something? You know, what are the ramifications? What can I do if I sign this? You know, because it's a contract, and once you uh, agree in a contract, a contract is a promise between parties. I promise that I won't do X, Y, or Z, and then in return you get something else. So it, it's you know, promises. And, and that's what every every contract case is. It's it's a promise somebody made and somebody's alleging that it was broken. 
you know, non-competes are something that kind of has always fascinated me a little bit because I remember studying them in law school and our professors told us that the courts frown on non-compete agreements. Um, is that still the case that they don't really like them um, in, your, in your experience? Well, Jeff, on that one, it depends on where you live. And well, what about we're in Florida? We are Broward in Florida. County, Palm Beach County. Absolutely. So, so just to give a, a global view, if if you're in New York or if you're in uh, California, those are two states that that are uh, anti non competes, and and with very limited exceptions, most of them are, are oftentimes not enforceable, mm -hmm. um, unless you know you've got very specific targeted issues, and then even then, um, I know California has general broad policies against them. Uh, in a case like Florida, Florida is one of the most pro-employer states in the country, meaning that, um, you know, there's a particular statute that governs these that essentially, um, you know, presumes that in certain circumstances, if you have a non-compete, that's two years or less for, for business purposes where you're trying to protect your interests. Generally, there's a presumption that that will be valid mm -hmm. as opposed to um, um, if it's over a certain period of time that it may be presumed to be invalid. And just because the law has presumptions doesn't mean that you can't overcome those presumptions, sure. but it makes it that much harder. And so there's general guidelines that you know, when you work in this industry and you you have this type of understanding, you know, you know that, that certain types of agreements will be enforced and others won't be. Well, I guess the key word is reasonable. I guess reasonable depends on what state you're in, too. Um, in the non-compete agreements that you have drafted, can you give us an example of something that you've drafted that's been deemed reasonable and something you've seen that's been struck down? It doesn't, you don't have to give any names or anything like that, but just to give us an idea where somebody, for example, who is a mailman can't be told that he can't go and sell cell phones or something like that. Right. You know, there has to be some type of link, doesn't there? Sure. I'll, I'll, I'll give an example of a case that I actually had last year. Uh, we represented a, uh, a sizable real estate company, um, you know, here in South Florida but they happen to have a subsidiary that's specifically focused on real estate for a specific community. In this case, it was uh, Kings Point up in, uh, up in West Palm Beach and, oh, okay. and that area. Um, and so uh, in that particular case, they had a former agent who had been on site in the office, who had worked on site with the Kings Point Signature Office, um, who got training, got many leads, you know, years and years and years worth of experience. Uh, just because she happened to be able to take advantage of the resources that our client had to offer. In that particular case, the non-compete agreement was upheld. We had an injunction hearing. Uh, after a two-day hearing, uh, the non-compete agreement was upheld. And then, of course, uh, when the other side appealed, the injunction was upheld by the Fourth District Court of Appeal. So that's an example of a case where um, it wasn't limiting it to say you can't sell any real estate anywhere, but it was saying you can't sell in this particular area because this is my specialized community. This is the area where I, you know, where we have our bread and butter. This is our area. And, and that particular client was dedicated specifically to that area. And that makes sense. Absolutely. That makes sense. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, an example of a non-compete that, that was ultimately uh, uh, held not enforceable. If you, you saw it in the news a couple of years ago, uh, there's a time when Jimmy John's uh, said that all of its sandwich makers, um, were were, were were held to non-competes where where because Jimmy John's you know is freaky fast in how they make their sandwiches that 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 somehow was a uh, a, a patented or that was a, a a process by which every person who then made sandwiches for Jimmy John wasn't going to be allowed to go work for Subway or go work for another or Quiznos or whoever the, you know a competitor was. Ultimately, that was challenged and uh, and I believe the news stories kind of indicated that that it was not upheld. Now. That's obviously not to say that, you know, maybe there might not be other situations, but that's an example of, um, you know, somebody who's making sandwiches can go make sandwiches for any other sandwich shop. That's not necessarily. So you can go from freaky fast to sandwich artist whenever you want to. Pronto and primos and uh, everything in between. I've eaten it all of them. <laughs> so, good stuff. Um, well, you also, Brian, you're involved in, you mentioned some real estate litigation. What type of cases do you find that you are commonly litigating, if you could? 
Sure, I'll, I'll give more general examples, mm -hmm. but um, you know, oftentimes you may just have a, a purchase and sale agreement for a particular piece of property, and then something happens, and either the sale is delayed, it doesn't go forward, then somebody's threatening to say, "No, we're going to keep the security deposit," or "Or we want you to make these changes." You know, so you sometimes have have those types of issues. You may also have issues where um, you know real estate may be involved in a in a in a deal, but it might be a, a family trust agreement. And then you're having a dispute over that, um, or you know you've got a, a limited liability company, and you've got you know two individuals that are you know they were once upon a time they were best friends. Uh, mm -hmm. They think that they're going to be in business together forever and never have any concerns or have any worries, and then you end up with the corporate divorce. You know where all of a sudden the sides can't agree, and they didn't necessarily create an exit plan. What do you do? And and those types of situations are are um, are difficult to deal with because you could have resolved many of those issues by upfront having some type of operating agreement that the parties had agreed upon. And sometimes those are difficult questions and people don't wanna face them. But by facing them, you can avoid uh, a lot more potential issues on the back end. Um, but as far as real estate transactions themselves, I mean, I've been involved in uh, uh, some title insurance cases. We represented the uh, uh, attorney's title insurance fund in a case a few years ago um, where, uh, you know, a prospective purchaser who ultimately didn't, you know, close on a property was trying to claim that the title insurer was somehow responsible and that they lost $35 million in profits associated with, 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 with the transaction. Um, I will tell you on that one, it took a little bit of time, but we finally got a summary judgment. And that, of course, was also upheld uh, by the second DCA. That that happened to be a case that was pending in the uh, in the Fort Myers area. And then um, I actually got to I went up to Lakeland and actually argued the appeal for that. Well, that um, must have been exciting, actually. That was. Um, that's a whole different process. So I happen to uh, do all parts of litigation. So. Um, I will handle a matter pre-litigation pre, pre itself. So sometimes you've got demands going back and forth between the attorneys. And then in those cases, sometimes you're able to resolve cases pre-suit. So you never actually have to file anything in any courthouse. Then you've got cases that you do file. Some of those cases, you might go to an early mediation, which is when the parties um, go with an independent, neutral third party who's trying to assist the parties in coming up with a solution that everybody can live with. Otherwise, uh, you know, the case can continue and then you've got motion practice. So you've got things such as motions to dismiss, motions for summary judgment. Um, you know, if, if those are denied and the claims survive and the parties can't agree, you know, ultimately you can go to trial. And then of course, after a trial or after a, a, a major ruling in a case that may either dismiss the claims or grant the judgment for somebody, then there's also still an appellate process. So the, 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 the case may still not be over. And so it's it's really not over until you get some type of finality, um, you know, either through the appellate process or somebody gets a judgment against them and then decides to pay. But, you know, 95, 96 percent of all cases result in some type of settlement. You know, so the parties are negotiating with one another and ultimately come to an agreement that the sides can live with one side gets released in return for payment. That's that's the typical way, and I'm sure that that's it's, also how you deal with pretty, personal injury. Yeah, it's deal. pretty. That's pretty uh, across the board for litigation. Yeah. Um, do you find that most of your litigation is in state court or federal court? Uh, I'm actually fortunate enough to do both, and I do both um, throughout the state. So, um, you know, the result of that is is in order to get into federal court, um, either you have to have something which is called subject matter jurisdiction which is you're suing under a federal statute. And, you know, so the court automatically as a matter of right would have that. An example of that would be claims that are made under like the Telephone Consumer Protection Act. Um, you know, just as an example, um, right. sometimes people may file a claim under uh, certain of the civil rights statutes, the federal statutes. Then you have uh, the second type of way to get into federal court is something called diversity jurisdiction, which is you have parties that are from different states so, for example, if you've got a, uh, a company that's based in Georgia and then a company that's based in Florida um, and the Florida company sues the Georgia company in Florida state court, the Georgia company can remove the case to federal court. Um, and there's different nuances and there's different things that go into that. So what that means essentially is if you file in one jurisdiction and the, and the 
plaintiff or whatever party tries to move it to another jurisdiction, you're not thrown out. You can continue on with the case. Right. The jurisdiction is is, is a huge thing in the law, especially on the civil side. We could sure we could talk for hours about jurisdictional type issues. But the 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 crux of it is that um, uh, you know jurisdiction is where you're going to ultimately have the case heard. And sometimes, you know, we were talking about state court versus federal court. Uh, the process known for taking a case from state court to federal court is called removal. And that's the, you know, the plaintiff has already chosen the forum of state court and the defendant would have the opportunity to remove the case if the amount of controversy is significant enough. Uh, the current threshold to get into federal court is $75,000. Um, to do that. Otherwise, um, if you have two companies from Florida, for example, that are fighting over money, that's going to always stay in state court because there is diversity. And so the federal courts would not have jurisdiction over that. Well, again, we've had a kind of a, a wheeling, dealing conversation, Brian, and it always is when we get together. But I wanted to end with talking about some of the uh, volunteer and charity work that you do in your spare time. In particular, you work with the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. I know that that's a cause that's very near and dear to your heart. Absolutely. So um, I have the fortune uh, working for a great firm that I that I that I do. I try to make it you know my personal business to try to give back to the community as I can. And so I'm involved with a number of different bar organizations. Uh, one of them is the, uh, the Broward County uh, Bar Association. I, I co-chair the Professionalism Committee. Um, I'm also the president-elect for the federal bar chapter here in Broward. Um, and I serve on, on a few other various uh, boards from a legal perspective. Um, but in addition to that, what's also near and dear to my heart is uh, Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. Um, I had the uh, the honor and privilege of being the man of the year for Fort Lauderdale in 2015, and then I nominated you the, the next yes, year. You did. And you know that was one of those organizations where you're 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 helping a greater purpose than ourselves. You know, we're helping people that we've never met, in the idea to to hopefully eradicate cancer. And so LLS focuses on blood cancers, and um, you know if you've seen the studies, you know. Um, the treatment and the research that goes into fighting blood cancers is almost universally helpful towards finding cures and finding, uh, um, you know, uh, um, other types of medications to hopefully be able to eradicate other types of cancer as well. That if you can solve blood cancers, you would be able to solve the other cancers. And that's, that's what a lot of the scientists and the researchers have said. Um, and, you know, for me, uh, it was a personal experience. Um, you know, I lost my mom to a rare form of, uh, uh, of a lymphoma a few years ago, um, you know, shortly after my wife and I, uh, Jill, right after we got married. Um, and then earlier this year, in the effort of trying to uh, to have the circle go full fully around, um, my daughter was actually a candidate for a student of the year um, recently. And um, actually just yesterday, we were at Joe DiMaggio um, giving out uh, a bunch of teddy bears that we had raised to, wonderful. Uh, through the oncology and through the children that were uh, that were there facing some treatments. And just to put a smile on somebody's face and to know that that we're doing what we can to make the world a better place. Um, yeah, that, that's what it's all about. Well, I, I again, it was such a rich experience going through that. And I thank you for nominating me for, for that man of the year. And uh, I know that some of you may remember when I was asking everybody for money on that, but it really was uh, worthwhile. And, you know, people were so generous, uh, you know, I, everybody's touched by it. You know, I, they are. And, and I've often found that it sometimes is easier to ask people for things that aren't for you than for, uh, than for others. And so uh, um, in that particular case, it's, it's, it almost became easier over time to just be like, hey, this is what I'm doing. I hope you can help. And, uh, um, you know, through tremendous support of viewers like you. Uh, viewers like you. We are, uh, you know, <laughs> we're, we're able to come that much closer and, and obviously, you know, you know, curing cancer um, is, is, a, is a great goal. Um, you know, I happen to have been involved with, um, you know, organizations promoting leadership for young professionals such as Emerge Broward, um, and then also like the Broward Center for the Performing Arts and just performing, you know, promoting arts and education in our community. So there's there's lots of ways to get involved. And, and I 
I personally believe that it's part of our civic duty and our ability as a, you know, it's, it's a privilege to be in this profession and to do what we do. And so being able to give back and being able to make a difference and to, to help people out where we can is just something extra that we do. Um, all, all lawyers are doing, you know, supposed to do some type of pro bono activities or activities to help the community. And, you know, you do that every day. Uh, I try to do that every day, um, you know, because it does make a difference. Yeah, it's, it, it makes it uh, all more worthwhile when you can actually help other people and through no other reason that you just want to, not that you want anything in return or anything like that. Well, Brian, I've really enjoyed talking with you. I always do. Before we end this, though, I wanted you to kind of tell the listeners who are the type of people that would hire a lawyer like yourself? Well, or the type of organizations, individuals? Well, we represent mid-sized and large-sized companies. And just because we're part of a law, a large law firm doesn't mean that the barrier to entry in that firm is, is insurmountable. Right. Um, you know, it really comes down to what the nature of the dispute is. Um, if you're fighting over, you know, a few thousand dollars, we're not going to be the lawyers that are going to be able to serve you in the best, the best way that we can. Um, you know, if you're talking about, you know, um, you know, sizable amounts of money, you know, let's say uh, $100,000 or more, then we can talk. In certain situations, each case is done on an individualized basis. So there may be cases where you've got $100,000 in dispute, but you may also be able to resolve that quickly for somebody without actually having to file a lawsuit. And you can try to negotiate that and try to work that around. Um, Oftentimes, you know, I, I deal with companies every day, uh, whether it's, you know, presidents of companies, uh, in-house counsel, and they have questions that they might want to bounce off you, you know, just, you know, regulatory type questions or questions of, hey, this is our policy. This is what we're doing. Do you think that this is right or do you think we should go in a different direction? And, you know, asking those questions up front is going to make such a difference because you can resolve things and then not necessarily have a problem on the back end. Or you, you did things the right way, so you have a complete defense if somebody tries to say that you did something wrong. So really, it just comes down to if you've got a problem, I, you know, I, I talk to people all the time, and there's, you know, there's cases that I'm able to take, cases that I can't take. Some cases I'm conflicted out, and I, and I refer them out to other people who I know would do a good job for, for a particular client. Really, it just depends on the needs. But uh, um, if, if you're uncertain of... of uh, of a particular question, don't be afraid to ask. And you know, you've heard the phrase "penny wise, pound foolish." Um, that example comes up all the time. I, I had one client who needed an operating agreement for his company. Um, he's like, oh, "It's like you know, it's a friend of mine. You know, it's like it doesn't have to be too formal." But we made it a formalized agreement. And then when he broke up with the other guy who he was involved in business with, he already had a plan in place, so he had the solution. It didn't cost him anything on the back end. All he had to do was say, here's what our agreement says. This is what we're doing. But if you have the situation where you don't have that agreement, you don't, you haven't taken the necessary steps, you don't have those protections in place, you could be lost. Um, and then it, you could be in protracted litigation because then both sides might become steadfast in how they handle things. So really it just comes down to, it doesn't hurt to consult. You may not necessarily hire, but if you consult and you, you, uh, uh, have a general understanding of the direction of where this may or may not go. Um, you know, that's the best thing you can do. And, and I'm there to try to be a quarterback for my clients, trying to get them through the process, uh, explaining things from the start to the finish. Um, but we want to do it in a way that that's going to be what their best interests are. And each client may have individualized best interests. But the goal is to to figure out what the game plan is uh, or figure out what your end goal is. And then let's work to try to get you there. Brian, can you tell everybody how they can get in touch with you if they have any questions? Absolutely. Uh, you can reach me. My email address is kochb at gtlaw.com. Um, and I'm also willing, uh, you see it on my bio so uh, or, or if, on my signature block. So you could always reach me. And my cell phone is 954-551-9993. Um, and pretty much as an attorney, uh, you know, we live in a 24 seven cycle, you know, there's always things that are coming up. Um, luckily I don't have, uh, you know, phones ringing off the hook in the middle of the weekend for, you know, <laughs> Hey, somebody got arrested. They need to get out of jail. We're, we're, uh,
we're not the lawyers for getting you out of jail. Uh, we're the lawyers for keeping you out to begin with so that the feds don't come after you at all. Well, that's, uh, a, that's a perfect, <laughs> perfect segue because, uh, you know, next, our next show is May 8th. I'm going to have my friend Matthew Konecki, who's a criminal defense attorney. He'll help you get out of jail. He so, will. you know, for <laughs> that's a perfect segue, Brian. You walked right into it. Perfect. Me. So I appreciate that. Well, thank you, Jeff. Thank you so much for hosting and for having me here tonight. It's been a pleasure and a privilege. Always good to see you, Brian. Thank you, everybody, for watching, listening. Again, May 8th, Matthew Konecki will be talking about criminal uh, defense. And I'm really looking forward to that one. There might be some wrestling puns in there, here and there. Matt and I are big wrestling geeks. Take care, everyone. Have a good night.